Coming up on Daily Tech News Show, a hologram of you that speaks another language, how we learn to stop worrying and love face app, plus the future of brain computer interfaces getting closer. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 17th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Bicentennial Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. Uh, and from a hot L.A. County area, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about old social networks, Plurk, Pounce, Path. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to hear more about that, get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start the show with a few tech things you should know. Google executive Karen Batia told the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee Tuesday that the company has terminated Project Dragonfly, which was investigating ways to offer search in China. It had been reported to have ended late last year, but Google had not publicly confirmed it until now. Uh, well, let me tell you about video games. Nintendo updated its main Switch console, this on the heels of their new light console they announced about a week ago, with promised battery life of 4.5 to 9 hours versus the current 2.5 to 6.5 by the way, that 6.5 never really reached in my house. Uh, while Nintendo did not announce specs, The Verge points out the FCC filing indicates Nintendo's planned uh, to update, or they have planned to update the Switch with a new system on a chip. New models of the Switch with extra battery life have, uh, or life have serial numbers beginning, beginning with XKW. Longer life means longer play. Hey. DJI announced a new Ronin gimbal for mirrorless cameras called Ronin S Compact or Ronin SC Lighter. That's the important part. 2.4 pounds, about 41% lighter than the Ronin S, which came out late last year. The Ronin SC is made of aluminum, magnesium, steel, and composite plastic. You can take it apart to fit it in a bag. Uh, it can carry up to 4.4 pounds on it, and the battery for the gimbal lasts up to 11 hours. That's a little less than the Ronin S, which was 8 pounds uh, in what it could carry and 12 hours of battery life. The DJI Ronin SC is available right now for $439, or you can get a pro bundle with some accessories for $500. $139. Microsoft announced that AT&T will use its Azure infrastructure and move most of its 250,000 employees to Microsoft 365 productivity and security services. That's a lot of folks. Sources tell CNBC that the multi-year deal is worth more than $2 billion. The companies are also joint developing tools for artificial intelligence and high-speed 5G wireless and plan to announce additional services later this year. That's what Microsoft's doing with AT&T right now, but they've been showing off a little bit about what they plan to do in the future, right, Scott? Yeah, this is really cool. So Microsoft unveiled a combination of Azure AI technologies and neural text-to-speech during a keynote of the Microsoft Inspire Partner Conference in Las Vegas that creates a digital version of a speaker whose speech is translated into another language in the original speaker's voice. So imagine somebody standing there, they're talking, uh, you then get a translation of that for some other language, Spanish, Japanese, whatever, in this case, Japanese, and boom, there's a version of her standing there saying those words in her voice. Not, not real time, though. Not no. real time. No, and not sync to her lips either, although I suspect that's coming too. But anyway, to show it off, Microsoft used Julia White, a company executive for Azure, speaking at a keynote and translating her speak uh, her speech rather into Japanese. You'll need a HoloLens to see this, although the video expresses it pretty well. You'll need access to Mixed Reality Capture Studio with proper lighting and high-res cameras to make it, but it's a peek into what's possible in the future. I think it's super cool. I went and watched it. Um, the... The translation was, it sounded like her speaking Japanese, like that was her tenor, her tone, her pitch. And it was very convincing and very cool. And a little shout out to gamers when she put her hand out at first and had a green hologram of herself in her hand. It was very much a Halo looking uh, moment. And people who play Halo know what I'm talking about. But we are getting closer and closer to a future where this is just happening. Podcasts will be done like this. Tom will translate to any language we want. <laughs> An image of us standing there doing it. Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing, we've talked before, you may remember, we talked before on DTNS about separate research, not Microsoft research, to take your voice, translate it, but use your voice's characteristics in taking that text-to-speech and translating it into something that sounds like you speaking another language. So Microsoft's doing something that isn't brand new, uh, but they sounds like they're doing it pretty well. And then they're matching it up with uh, a hologram to make it, give it a little extra sauce. I'm not sure exactly how 
uh, practical this is, especially if it's not real time. But I suppose eventually you could be having hologram meetings, avatars using your HoloLens. Everybody could be speaking different language. And if they get to that real time ability, uh, everybody would hear everybody else in the same language. So uh, it's pro it got a lot of promise for the future and certainly made a great demo at a conference well even if even if there was something you know we, we talked about this being translated into japanese okay let's say there was a keynote that was getting lots of buzz and i really wanted to watch that keynote well i don't speak japanese so i would need it to be subtitled that's really my only option right now so something like this maybe you know even after the fact if it gained enough traction is is a really cool option yeah, yeah well, i guess what i'm saying is you don't really need the hologram for that right right people, but yeah sure the hologram part no. is definitely just kind of frosting on that cake, but I also, um, I didn't see anything that indicated how well this was translated. So I guess there's still that I'd love a Japanese speaker to listen to that and tell me if it sounded right or not. Uh, there, I, I have questions about that. Translation technology is cool, but it's not always hundred percent there. So, uh, neat though, on the surface, looks really cool. Well, as expected, the EU Competition Commission formally opened an antitrust investigation into Amazon. The company allows businesses to sell on its marketplace, but Amazon uses that sales data to then inform its own offerings, which then compete against those smaller sellers. That's where people have an issue. In response to a separate German investigation, Amazon will change its terms for sellers starting August 16th. The company no longer gives itself unlimited rights to terminate accounts without justification and may give 30 days notice. Amazon will also let European disputes be handled in more than just Luxembourg, where it has been in the past. Restrictions on what sellers can say in public were also reduced. The new terms will apply to Europe, North America, and Asia. Austria has dropped its independent investigation as a result of these changes as well. Yeah, so it's not a big surprise that the EU is uh, officially launching the investigation. What they're trying to find out is because Amazon sells its own products in the same marketplace where it lets other people sell things, are they abusing that dominant position because those sellers don't have a lot of other places to sell? Are they taking the data from the small people, the small businesses that sell? Because they're not small people, small businesses that sell, <laughs> uh, and then and then Life figuring out how to compete with them and dr either drive them out of business, or in some cases in the past they would just tell them to go away, like we're going to sell this product now, not you, and kick them off the platform. This German, this separate German probe will stop them from doing that second thing. They will no longer be able to just kick them off for no reason. They'll have to give a reason. They'll have to give them 30 days notice. So that's good. Uh, I don't know how much that will change the EU investigation of this, which will still be about, are you abusing your dominant market position to outcompete the businesses on your own platform? Yeah. Also, I've never understood how the Amazon, you know, the Amazon choice label that we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is yep. that determined? I'd love to, I know that's not part of this investigation, but it made me think of it. Like if I go buy a nylon braided lightning to USB a cable, which I had to do recently, um, they give me a big, a bunch of search results, but the number one search result is Amazon choice. Then there's this bestseller. Then there's other ones with different brands and stuff. Um, I often know what brands I want. I look for anchor or something, but this Amazon choice one came up from a brand I've never really heard of. Uh, I don't know how they choose that, but that feels like bumping in front of everybody in line a little bit. That feels like cutting in. According to Business Insider, a product marked Amazon's choice is an item that many buyers have purchased and were satisfied with as told to Amazon through reviews data. Okay. Well, if they've got that data, then I guess maybe they're safe there. But but it's so also in many cases undercutting a similar product from that company that you were probably looking for, Scott, because I had the same thing I had to do over the weekend. I had to buy some cable sort of emergency Amazon stuff. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, it's sort of like, okay, I can see where this this does feel like anti-competitive behavior. So mm -hmm. what happens? Like, do prices get fixed? Can you well, never, you know, give me an HDMI cable for under a certain amount that, you know, the smaller seller has has deemed is the appropriate price? Let's not confuse Amazon Choice and Amazon Basics because right. You're right. Amazon Choice is Amazon saying this is the one most frequently reviewed well that people buy according right. to our algorithm, which often is the Amazon Basics thing, right? Which makes you suspicious. Then there's Amazon Basics, which is uh, we found out that people were selling these, these braided HDMI cables uh, for $5. So we went and ordered a bunch because we're Amazon and we're selling them for $4 now and undercutting their market. And that's what the investigation is about. Yeah, and hopefully the results of all this will show us that we can trust them with this because I do trust it. I see that bad 
badge and I go, oh, well, I feel pretty good about this if Amazon likes it for good or for bad. That's that's the kind of trust they're building. And if they blow that, that's that's real hard to earn. Back. But again, that's not what this investigation is. About. I totally. I, yeah, I don't want to confuse the two. I keep doing that. But but yes, like it's just straight up across the board. We'll see what happens, because what I want is a trustworthy Amazon out of all of this, because I buy a lot of stuff there. This is purely is me as the consumer. And, and this and is I, basically whether they're driving the some businesses off the platform, which you'll never notice because they replace that business with right. something that hopefully is just as good. But, right. you know, right. it's not fair for them to do that if they're abusing their position. Right. Hey, folks, have you been inundated recently online with photos of your friends uh, simulated as old people? Uh, thank FaceApp, which has been around since 2017. It's gone viral before. This is not its first rodeo, uh, but it resurged in popularity over the last week. Also got another round of fear about what it does with your data, which also has happened before with this exact same app, but whatever. Uh, the Verge points out that iOS researcher and CEO of Guardian Firewall, Will Strafik, uh, looked into the network behavior of FaceApp, found that the app does not upload your entire camera roll, as some people claimed, but that it will upload single images to an Amazon Web Service server with your authorization uh, to apply filters server side. Researcher Jane Wong saw the same thing. You may not realize you're giving that authorization. That could be part of the problem. FaceApp's parent company CEO Yaroslav Gonchatov told The Verge the photos are uploaded to save bandwidth and get deleted not long after. That's a little vague, but uh, hopefully that's true. Also of issue, FaceApp's privacy policy says it may use people's usernames, names, and likenesses for commercial purposes. That's freaking people out. But I found out that the sandwich shop Rayburn uh, Sam Rayburn Sandwiches also has those exact same terms of service. This is kind of boilerplate stuff out there. Always sounds crazy out of context, but a lot of websites have the same uh, sort of wording. However, what could turn into a problem for FaceApp potentially is uh, lawyer Elizabeth Potts Weinstein thinks the terms that allow data to be transferred to any of the company's locations is not GDPR compliance. And FaceApp is operating in Europe, so they have to comply with the GDPR. So can we, well, yeah, <laughs> here's the thing. I will say this for their second viral explosion. Something has changed. I used this app in 2017 and it wasn't as good as it is now at giving well, me. Yeah, they four... kept updating the app between the last time you used it and this time. That's yeah, nice. it's just that technology has gotten freaky good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, terms of service, who owns my data? This is all important, I guess, for people to argue about. I'm here to say I don't want to see what I look like when I'm a hundred and freaking five years old because it seems too accurate. And I think they're I saw us on Instagram and you look great. Oh my gosh, dude. No, <laughs> it is so bad. Like I look like the crazy guy at the old folks home. They have to strap down and not it, let it, it, it was jarring. I'll yeah, be honest. It was, really it was a bit jarring. jarring. I actually didn't do it because I don't want to see what I look like. Not so much that I'm worried about what FaceApp is doing with my data because I've already used it to turn me into a, a man uh, previously. <laughs> It, but it's funny because there there are a few things going on. You know, people saying, "Whoa, hold on, Russian company, red flag," no, you know, haha. -ha. And, and 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 you're sort of like, okay, well, I mean, it doesn't mean that every company that might build an app that is based in Russia is like out to get you, even if you think that other people in Russia are out to get you. So there's there's some of that going on, and also. As Tom mentioned, the terms of service, people go, this is crazy if you really read it. Well, you know what? You're not reading a lot of terms of services then because you've you've probably signed up for an app that has a very similar terms of service and it just didn't register the same way. And so this is something that all of a sudden seems really dangerous and really nefarious. They have all our photos. Yeah. And and, and that 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 is somewhat widely done. Already, I mean, guys. A worldwide, non exclusive, fully paid up, royalty free, unrestricted, perpetual, irrevocable, fully transferable, assignable, and fully sub licensable right and license to copy, reproduce, edit, modify, distribute, transmit, translate, display, perform, publish, sell, adapt, create derivative works from, and otherwise use your content. How dare you, Rayburns.com? <laughs> Yeah. Oh wait, I'm sorry. All I We're not all mad at the sandwich, sandwich place. Yeah, uh, I, sandwich. I, 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 I now I'm mad at them too. Yeah, I will what say, um, Mark Fraunfelder over at Boing Boing posted a uh, a link to a company, uh, AI Portraits, who like will turn your face 
into a a sort of artistic portrait take mm -hmm. today. Their privacy policy is your photos are sent to our servers to generate portraits. We won't use data from your photos for any other purpose and we'll immediately delete them. I like that privacy policy. That that would settle everyone's mind. It's also simple. Like yeah. Simple stuff like that. Just plain English. Let's just go and tell me what you're going to do. Even if it's to steal it, be plain about it. Yeah. Like, I don't care. But yeah, that's pretty boilerplate. We're all going to be fine. That anyway. trouble for different reasons. And the to thing is, is that the thing is, is that the 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 fear, uncertainty and doubt about what this app might do with with your data later on by selling it to a third party, perhaps or a state organization. OK, that could happen. I mean, it's it's not that it won't happen necessarily, but but that's you could you could again, you could say that about you could say that about a lot of services you're already using. Yeah. Uh, and and to uh, people in Russia who don't do bad things, we know there are many of you. Prashu Proshenya Vinovat. Nice. Yeah. Da. <laughs> French startup Stonely launched a new service that tries to solve the often frustrating steps of contacting customer support agents when you have issues with a service. And often in those times, you're very, very upset already. Stonely lets small companies easily create modules that surface relevant content so that customers can then understand and solve issues themselves, kind of walking through some steps. A Stonely module could be embedded on any page or a blog and work like a deck of slides with buttons to jump to the relevant slide relating to the issue that you might have. And companies can incorporate guides without writing any of their custom code. So that sounds great. Yeah. I mean, this is tempting for, for me to do to help people out with stuff because it's like, oh, I, I won't have to spend. It's not even that I can't code. I don't want to code. Right. And a lot of people don't yeah. want to code either. So if you can do something faster, that means you're more likely to create something that will then help your customers. And man, I'm so frustrated with those those uh, companies out there that that still re rely on forum threads to, to be their support, mm -hmm. which are always unsatisfying. I, I rarely find a forum thread where I go, wow, this was a clear, concise way of solving my problem. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. In, in many cases, someone's like yelling into the void, help. And then, and then you see like four other people have the similar issue and like, and then it just dies. It hasn't gotten better with other forms of that either. Like YouTube videos are great on how to do stuff. Uh, Discord groups and slash groups are great. Like uh, the communities have moved to new homes, but finding and surfacing the stuff you need has not gotten any easier, maybe more complicated than ever. So this sounds cool. I like it. I also like the name Stonely. It's a cool name. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. I did that to prove it's not a green screen. <laughs> Neuralink, a company founded in 2017, told the New York Times it is working on a technology to improve human brain computer interfaces. Neuralink is developing fine threads, about a third of the diameter of a human hair, which could be implanted with less impact to brain tissue than the current methods, which often involve electrodes or, or other kind of larger sensors. The company intends to begin publishing peer-reviewed papers on its work. That's great. I mean, they have papers right now. They're not peer-reviewed, but they want to start doing that. That's one of the reasons they're giving this interview. Uh, Co-founder Max Hodak said near-term uses for the technology could include control of prosthetics, uh, reversing hearing and vision loss. The company is pursuing a collaboration with Stanford neurosurgeons. They'd like uh, to start doing some controlled, you know, approved human testing as early as next year. A demonstration of the technology on a rat showed 10 times the data transfer of the best sensors previously, according to Bloomberg. And co-founder and Neuralink CEO Elon Musk, of course, is talking about someday using such technology to achieve symbiosis with an artificial intelligence. But don't <laughs> let that stop you from believing there's what does it mean my car will share my brain yeah he's like we'll merge with the ai even if they're benign well that's the best way to survive someday elon someday you're not wrong uh but there are also really practical benefits uh, to this technology and it sounds very promising yeah i'm i think this stuff's really cool um and I also do think he's probably right about the far-flung future that's his job is to be a visionary that's partly why elon musk is who he is so Keep on doing that, Elon Musk. But the, the technology is currently constituted. I would love to see human studies. Uh, I'm ready for my implants. I've said this for years. I'm ready for things that augment my life. But you know who's even more ready are people who need it like now for things you mentioned, like vision loss and hearing loss and yeah. that sort of stuff. This, is, these, this represents huge steps forward. 
and getting peer reviewed and moving toward human trials and all of that as part of that. Uh, I'll worry about me interfacing with my car in another decade. That's fine. Yeah, I, I think this is a, uh, this is a really interesting company. I, I don't want to come off as sounding like it's it's the first to ever do this. All the technologies it's talking about have existed in other arenas, other researchers, other companies. Uh, this isn't brand new, but it does sound like they have a good approach to improve them uh, and improve them maybe a little faster uh, than, than we thought. Uh, they haven't done it yet, but at least my take is Neuralink is worth watching uh, more so than maybe a Hyperloop or another Elon Musk associated venture uh, might be as much as I, I would love the Hyperloop uh, to come to reality. It seems to have stalled a bit uh, in the past few years, whereas Neuralink uh, is using technology that's proven. It's not like from the ground up a brand new uh, approach to things. Uh, and, and I think that that makes me more confident that this might turn into something. Let's ask the rat how it feels. Roger? Oh, I, you mean oh, it. Oh, <laughs> wow. I kid, I joke, I love Roger. It's, it's Scott's kid. birthday, he's a little punchy. I'm allowed to make bad jokes <laughs> about people I consider friends. That's how. That's the deal, right? Well, Everyone it, gets one. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, your Scott, one, Scott. Scott and I were both like, oh yeah, let's, you know, like implant stuff into my body, not a problem. These, you know, it's, 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 it's a third the diameter of a human hair. It's nothing. But I would like to know how the rat feels. Yeah, and and honestly, um, that that's an important point because right now to implant their technology, they do say they need to drill a hole in your skull. Which, if you need, if it's going to improve, it's good. If it's going to restore your vision or it's going to give you control of a prosthetic limb, perhaps uh, you might be willing to do that. That is a riskier surgery. Uh, sure. They do think they will be able to implant these in the future with laser uh, drilling, which would be safer, more precise, uh, less invasive than you know drilling a hole in your skull again. Uh, not that trepanation doesn't have a long and storied history, but I wouldn't have it done. Whereas pinpoint holes to put some fibers in, and, and, and also they hope to be able to make this wireless. There's a lot of they hope to be's here. Don't get me wrong. Like uh, it's still not here, but they're all based on technologies that have been shown to be able to work. They just need to make them work together, make them work at scale, make them work better. Uh, this could be something that the kids are all doing in 20 years, getting their, their Neuralink in implants. And us old people are trying to decide if we really want somebody shooting lasers at our skull to be able to catch the latest cool technology. Well, that's the question I always ask myself is, okay, if you, if you, if there is, a prosthetic uh, that that you could use better because of technology like this, it were um, vision loss or something where you're like, oh wow, this is this is really great for accessibility. Then that the the technology is 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 great in my book already. But yeah, how how will the kids be improving themselves just for fun later yeah, on when the technology the gets to that point? That's always the question. It's and it's sometimes it's cost prohibitive to even know what that's going to be until it comes down to a point that everybody can afford it or it becomes not a luxury item or not a luxury choice but a a common thing that you can get and yeah. who knows like for me it's about near field communication and your brain being able to tell something to do something without you having to verbalize it or without you having to to do anything else there are people who are who are just in a bed and can't move and can't do anything um and giving them that the power to control more of their world this way seems so amazing how kids will use it in 100 years to text their friends while they're supposed to be paying attention in class i don't know chances are something like this would replace what class is to begin with so it, it feels like it's too far flung to figure that out but in the near term i think there's some huge benefits for people that are here now yeah, uh, the real silver blade asked the question that Elon Musk is is answering. Uh, could this be used to for accelerated learning or downloading knowledge into the brain directly? And that's what he's talking about. Is eventually, probably fifty or hundred years down the road, maybe maybe not quite so much. Uh, yeah. You you could have direct connection to artificial intelligence, to information, and bring it into your mind. Uh, before we move on, real quickly, uh, Netflix uh, announced its earnings. We usually we we don't pay as much attention to this stuff as as we used to, but uh, Netflix announced uh, global subscriber growth that missed predictions, and that's significant. Uh, the company's overall growth for paid subscribers did climb by 2.7 million worldwide, uh, but lost 130,000 in the U.S. So that 
it's a big deal because there's been a lot of faith that Netflix would continue to grow and grow and grow. And I think uh, this is going to probably out of proportion cause a lot of people to cool down on on Netflix. So we'll we'll take a look at that uh, in a little more depth tomorrow. But that's that's just happening right before the show here. If you've got Netflix stories or other stories, you could submit them to our subreddit. Not only submit, but you can also vote on other stories that your peers have submitted at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't yet, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. We got some good responses to our conversation yesterday on Grammarly. The first one comes from Erwan saying, concerning the short subject on Grammarly you guys talked about yesterday, I think that you view the app, I think you view that this app as not necessarily useful because English is your mother tongue. I'm French. Yes, I was born ready. We all are. Shout out to Patrick. But I also discovered this app when I moved to the UK. I learned English by myself and Grammarly helped me tremendously to improve my spelling and my grammar. I paid for the pro version for a year, which gives very good perks and helped me for some cover letters, for example, but also personal use. I find it a bit expensive, though. The bottom line is the app helped me discover new words, new ways of expressing myself in a language that is not the first one that I learned. And I still use it today. And I'm very grateful for both the app to, and towards the person who helped me discover it. I wish it could be available in other languages since I'm learning Portuguese now, but sadly, I didn't find any equivalent. Thanks to all of you for my daily shot of tech news and laugh with the GDI. Nice. Uh I I thought I expressed that the app was incredibly useful yesterday, so that, that kind of took me back. But it's a good point, nonetheless. Uh, and and Gary had a similar point about using it uh, to help you if English is not your first language. So a couple of people weighing in on that. Erwin and Gary, thank you very much. I think those are both really good points. Uh, I I I would like it to just kind of help improve my writing in general. But but I hadn't even thought of that use case. So that's cool. Absolutely. Uh, then Chris wrote in and said, the crux of the issue with Monaco using Huawei for 5G, which we talked about yesterday, is that telecommunications there was nationalized and then later privatized to Monaco Telecom that was granted a monopoly over all landline mobile and internet communications. And it is technically illegal in Monaco to arbitrage, much like situations that have arisen in India. If you're like, wait, what's that? Here we go. That creates a bit of a pickle for those of us visiting Monaco who'd rather not have our communications monitored by the government. Voice over IP is expressly forbidden as arbitrage. In other words, you're, you're breaking the monopoly by using VoIP. Uh, but I believe that the going consensus is that multimedia sharing like WebEx or Zoom are not considered competing with Monaco's telecom and therefore not arbitrage. Luckily, most of the private yachts coming into port there have satellite internet, much like cruise ships and airplanes, such that any incidental arbitrage occurring while in the waters goes unmonitored. Yes, this is certainly a first world problem, but it does create practical challenges for conducting business securely while in country. It's an awesome place to visit, but beware that one will be paying Disneyland prices for everything <laughs> while there. Yeah. My good, first reaction was this, the focus on him uh, just kind of <laughs> casually throwing out the yacht solution uh, to the Monaco issue. Uh, yeah, but hey, yeah, just get a sat satellite internet on the rich yacht. people are welcome in the DTNS audience. Uh, and and Chris <laughs> does, you know, he does say, look, I know this is a first world problem, but it's an interesting insight in Monaco that I certainly never would have had. Yeah, I picture. Is it OK that I'm picturing him in like uh, one of those white? uh super light cotton suits and <laughs> well chris didn't say he was on the yachts so i'm just i don't know right I'm picturing yeah. him. he's got a fancy drink he's got that really kind of um uh, miami vice looking suit on and mm -hmm. shirt real low lots of lots of hairy chest and some cool glasses i think chris is a cool dude and it's all in my head <laughs> yeah I uh, the one time I've been to Monaco, I, I went to the casino in Monte Carlo, which is sort of it's all one big place. And it was it was like a lot of us tourists sort of like looking at each other like, what do we do? What do we do? Do we play a hand? Um, that, that's where the <laughs> minimum bets were like really high. So I yeah. didn't. But yeah. yeah, that was uh, anyway, that's my that's well, my takeaway. Chris, Chris may have inspired me to uh, create a, a higher new level on Patreon for for those <laughs> who who use their yachts more often. Yeah. Um, maybe, yacht maybe, dwellers show yourselves. Maybe yeah. this was Christopher Cross, creator of one of the greatest yacht rock songs of all time, Sailing. So I, that's oh, what I'm going to Take me that. away. Yeah. yeah. Take me yeah. away where I've always wanted to be. Uh, like perhaps we could have a yacht rock his themed yacht level rock. on our Patreon. <laughs> perhaps. We'll think about it. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Ride like the wind. 
Uh, <laughs> thanks to everybody who wrote in a really, really great mailbag this week. Keep it coming, guys. We love to hear your feedback. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today on his birthday. Mm. No less. Scott, yeah. let folks know where they can celebrate with you tonight. Well, not only am I here on my birthday, I was here long enough to know that Sarah knows more about Christopher Cross hits than I was aware of, and that's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, also, there's lots going on on the site despite the birthday. I don't really take this day off. So if you want to find great content, check it out at frogpants.com. And there's plenty of it. Shows, podcasts, uh, live stuff, live streams, video game things, art things. It never ends at frogpants.com. And if you want to follow my daily musings, you can find me at uh, Scott Johnson on Twitter. About five years ago, Yahoo approved season six of Community back when Yahoo thought it could make TV shows. Uh, if you want more of these kinds of flashbacks, Co-executive producers on our Patreon get a bonus show once a month looking back at our lineups of yesteryear. Sign up right now, patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more and tell a friend, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>